help the police suppress protests against the critical shortages in Poland. What is it like in Poland today? In a letter from Warsaw, Jerry King looks at the troubled nation through the daily problems of people trying to feed themselves. Hugh, the longer I live here and the worse things get, the more puzzling are the polls. I keep wondering how long Americans would put up with endless, countless lines. My guess is we would have had riots in the streets and long ago. But polls just seem to stand there and take it. Not that they could do much else. Protest marches have not produced the extra food. The government has no money to import. And anyway, you get the impression the government hopes these interminable lines will make people angry with solidarity and the strikes, which lower production still further. And if the Polish patient sometimes seems to be wearing a bit thin, I think that's understandable. It can take eight to ten hours of frustration to get the food that goes on the Polish dinner table. Mrs. Katarzyna Makowska is a typical Pole, and that's official. For three years, she reported everything she spent to the Bureau of Statistics, which considered her to be an average Pole. ABC News cameras followed Mrs. Makowska through a normal day to find out how she copes with her shopping. She had already been out at 5.30 in the morning. In accordance with the Polish protocol of line waiting, she'd reserved a place in three different lines. The first was for meat. All meat is now supposed to be sold in government stores. That has not cut out the black market. It has lowered supplies to it and has raised black market prices. Mrs. Makowska quickly learned her butcher still had not received the day's delivery, so off she went. Now retired, Mrs. Makowska has one commodity Poles need these days, time. Often she'll shop for friends, but many people simply take time off work to get in these lines, and absenteeism lowers production and fuels further shortages. This line for cigarettes hasn't moved either, and she knows her place will still be saved, so off she goes again. Poles are not starving, she says, but we do have to work at it, and she certainly does. This time, she tries a private bakery, where the line is only for special bread to go on sale shortly. Poland does have private enterprise. More than 10% of its stores are privately owned. But now, they too have problems in getting supplies. With her first purchase, the bread, in her handbag, five hours after she started, Mrs. Makowska is back in the cigarette line. She says she'll join any line, even if she doesn't know exactly what's for sale. All of us have money, she says, but we can only buy whatever comes along. These lines have become gossip centers, though often the information they produce is more concerned with what can be bought where than it is with who's doing what. Now remember, she started at 5.30, but the cigarette line is finally moving. The ration she'll get works out at between 8 and 11 cigarettes per day at a cost of 25 to 75 cents a pack, depending on quality. Some people seem to use up their quota just waiting to buy more. Mrs. Makowska's cousin has just given her her ration card without waiting in line first, so that causes one more hassle. Another woman objects. Line waiting protocol says you can reserve your place and leave, but you can't have someone else buy for you if you just arrive at the last moment. But at last, it's mission accomplished, and though she vows never again, she knows full well she will another butcher shop. And here there's ground meat, dog food, she calls it. You never know what's in it. A year ago, she wouldn't touch it. Today, she buys at 49 cents a pound. And she's off to the vodka line for the one bottle per month ration from a government store. She's also booked a place in that line, but she's missed her turn. Rather than starting from the end again, she just gives up. Back home, there's four flights of stairs to be climbed. Her building has no elevator. And with some cigarettes and a chicken and a pound of ground meat to show for more than six and one half hours, Katarzyna Makowska, 58, and with a heart condition, decides that's enough for today. But coping with life in Poland today involves more than patience and perseverance. It takes ingenuity, and having a green thumb helps, too. Many Poles have purchased, others have just taken over, land for private gardens. But here, gardening is more than just a hobby. 
This man grows more than he'll personally need. Like many of the nation's private farmers, he'll sell off the excess. Mrs. Makovska and her husband own two plots. They're not large, but they do produce most of the vegetables she'll need for the coming year. Most will end up as preserves. She says she's still eating last year's produce, and that's certainly a help given today's shortages. She also knits and sews much of her own clothing, and some, too, to trade with neighbors. She also exchanges some of the things she buys from those lines she happens to come across. Right now, two bars of soap will get you one bottle of shampoo or a tin of cocoa. A bottle of vodka will drown your sorrows or buy six ounces of coffee. Necessity is the mother of the rebirth of bartering. As I said, thus far, you have to admire the Poles' patience and their ability to cope with all their problems. But people like Mrs. Makovska would be embarrassed if this letter from Warsaw began to sound like an appeal for charity. She told me of receiving a food parcel from an uncle in Brooklyn. She sent back a note which said politely, thanks, but no thanks, things aren't that tough yet. But like many Poles, Mrs. Makovska also said she thinks things will get worse this winter. And then she said she doesn't know how she'll cope. You? And it may get worse if reported Soviet plans are carried out. Their strategy of putting added pressure on the Polish economy could cause still more shortages. And today's action by the Polish government ordering the army to help the police keep order could be an ominous turn. Well, later in the broadcast, Geraldo Rivera brings us an inside look at Simon and Garfunkel and their gigantic concert in New York last weekend. And airfares, hundreds of calls to the airlines gave us hundreds of different fares for the same trip. John Stossel reports on the costly confusion next. This portion of 2020 is brought to you by the totally new 1982 Lincoln Continental. The approach clearly new, the discovery unexpected. A new Continental, the trimmest Continental ever fashioned, yet one of the finest riding Continentals ever built. The 1982 Continental, the most unconventional Continental in 40 years. Now you don't worry where the sun is when you take a picture. As long as it's on what you're shooting. Well, no more. Now the sun can be behind you, in front of you, or not even out. The sun's got to be somewhere. Got it right in here. There's a piece of the sun in Polaroid's new sun camera. Not the real sun. Don't quibble. It's a new system with the fastest color print film made. 600 speed. Now you can turn bad light into good pictures. Here, I'll shoot you with the sun behind you. You'll get a silhouette. Not anymore. See, you're glowing. You've never been so sure of an instant picture. Wonderful. But what if you shoot me in good light? Then it uses just enough of its own light to touch up the small shadow. You see, mixing in our light can make any picture better. You use it on every shot. Until you run out of money. Oh, you could save money. Why waste film in bad light? Besides, you never buy flash or extra batteries. Swell. But if they put a piece of the sun in every camera, there won't be any sun left. Well, that's a production problem. I'm in sales. You've never been so sure. Starting Wednesday. Rory! Lost in the world of forbidden love. I want you night after night after night. Possessed by a passion that scanned two continents. Now you're mine. It's my right. If you love me, it's my right. Haunted by desires that could tear them apart. If you had to have someone, why didn't you just go to some tart? Surrender to the passions of the Manions of America. Wednesday on ABC. It used to be that airfares in this country were dictated by the Civil Aeronautics Board, the CAB. The lowest price you had to pay for a trip was regulated. Then the CAB deregulated the industry. Airlines could charge whatever they wanted. That started a price war that has left the traveler confused. Here is consumer correspondent John Stossel. John? Hugh, I don't know how you book your flights, but I used to think you could just call the airlines, ask for the cheapest fare, and they'd give it to you. But it doesn't work that way. One reason for the confusion is that all the airlines want us to fly them. That's what friendly skies are all about. Fly United anywhere for $179 or less. Western's $50 travel pass. At $179, everyone can see what makes America beautiful. 
Hello. Hi. I want to fly to San Francisco. Okay. Then uh, Miami. Then San Diego, Houston, Jacksonville, Las Vegas, <laughs> Detroit, Sarasota. Fly me to the moon. Let me play among the stars. The moon, the stars, Jupiter, and Mars is about what the airlines promise us to get us on board. But one thing we'll promise you, once on board, unless your trip is simply one stop, you've probably paid more than you have to, perhaps hundreds of dollars more. I'll show you. We went to Stapleton Airport, Denver, Colorado, one of the busiest in the country. I mapped out a trip that would take me from Denver to St. Louis to New York, Milwaukee, and back to Denver. Travel experts in the Civil Aeronautics Board told us the cheapest legal fare on this trip was $475. Then I set out to see what the airlines would tell me. The Ozark clerk first talked about how complicated it was. We offer different fares on every flight. I okay. could stand up here and offer different fares for every single flight of the day. I would like the cheapest. You can go anytime, day so, as long as it's cheap. He said the lowest fare was $576. That's $100 more than the CAB's quote. I tried Continental. Again, I gave the same cities, same dates. I'd fly day or night, just make it the cheapest fare. Well, she worked hard at it. In fact, I waited there a full hour. Made me think of a Continental commercial I'd seen. Continental knows how important time is to the business traveler, so we don't waste a minute of it. Finally, after an hour's work on the phones, on computers, and getting help from other agents, I was sure she'd come up with the $475 fare. Wrong. The total was $590. $590. $115 high. At Frontier, the clerk said he couldn't compute the fare. Our reservations can get you that, that information. They've got a fuller use of the machines than we do. Too complicated to do at the counter, he said. I had to use one of their special reservations telephones. They were nice about it. They gave me a phone from behind the desk. The agent on the phone said my ticket would cost me $697, and she sent me back to the counter to pick it up. I told him that I was running a test, that I knew there was a much lower fare. If I know I can fly there for 470 bucks, and you told me 697, I'm being ripped off. I agree that somebody else found you better fare than she did. All I can do is be honest and tell you, I don't know how they got either one of the fares. Well, if he was confused, so were we. $222 more than I had to pay. I tried TWA, one of the giants. They'll get me the lowest price. $735. $735, all right. That's the cheapest way I can go. That's it. That's it, all right, except it's $260 high. Then Republic, her price, $794. I'm sure that's right under coach fare. I have to go. To sum up, nobody got me the lowest price. And some airlines would have charged me $300 more than I had to pay. Hundreds of phone reservations on similar trips got us hundreds of other wrong prices. Nobody means to make a mistake, but there's so many different fares and so many different everything that we just can't keep track of them. I don't understand the regulation. I'm not even sure I understood regulation. I do feel sorry for the agents and for the telephone reservations clerks around the country. I don't think they were trying to cheat me. It's just that it's all so complicated. Every month, there are more than 100,000 fare changes. We have a 25% discount, so the fare comes to 775. Okay, that's a Y28, and that would be, the ITX fare would be 1064. It's the called the Circle Trip Fare, Transcon Circle. Super Coach, Commuter, Q Fares, K Fares, Y Fares, Super Savers, Open Jawed Super Saver. It's something of a morass, I would say. Marvin Cohen is the CAB's outgoing chairman. He says the problem is the airline's old computers. In the old days, you didn't have these choices. And now that you have a lot of choices, it's going to take the system some time to catch up. And computers that the airlines sort of brag about how up-to-date they are, are not up-to-date. No, they're not up-to-date yet, no. And, and it'll be another year, maybe two years, before they are. But wait a second. Like. United told us they already have the best computers, computers containing two million different fares from 28 airlines. 
they'd get the fares right, they said. So we ran another test, this time here in Las Vegas. I said I wanted to fly to New York, Miami, Indianapolis, and back. When we called United, the airline said the price would be more than $1,000. But a short time later at the counter, I was told... $671. The difference between the phone call and the counter, $475. Three more calls got three different prices. We tried some other United routes, made 40 calls in all, and got the same price only twice. Mistakes aren't the only reason we didn't get the cheapest price. When they checked their computers for fares, some agents, when we asked them, did make an effort to find us a lower fare, even if it put us on another airline. Other agents didn't. Frontier was the only carrier to readily give us an interview. Some airlines told us about a cheap Ozark fare or a cheap Continental fare. Some told us about other fares. Call them. You don't do it. We don't do it. We showed Ryland tape of his clerks charging me $200 more than the lowest fare. He said he couldn't really comment since he wasn't there. So I asked him to try it, and he did. He called his own airline. Travel any time of the day on those dates. And all we're after is to be able to move the two bodies at the lowest possible cost. OK. What's that all add up to? 332 per person round trip. He called again, different agent. This time the fare was $408, $76 more. Why so much difference? Why such I mistakes? I have no idea. Of course, it wasn't just his airline. We made hundreds of calls to all the big airlines, and there were mistakes on almost every call. We seldom got the same price twice. Of the biggest airlines, three cheers for Delta. They came closest to the lowest price most often. So what does the consumer do? Always call Delta? No, they made some big goofs, too. I'd call a travel agent. In our survey, travel agents did average lower prices. But I say average. The agents made expensive goofs, too. So with agent or airline, I think the smartest move is to make several calls and just take the cheapest quote. They may even goof in your favor. It should happen. Thank you, John. College freshmen hoping to join fraternities still go through trials of violence and fear, and the end is too often death. Bob Brown reports on fraternity hazing next. I'd like to know what law is it that says that a woman is a better parent simply by virtue of her sex. Kramer versus Kramer, one of the most honored films of our time, is back. Winner of five major Academy Awards, including Best Picture of the Year, Dustin Hoffman, Best Actor, Meryl Streep, Best Supporting Actress, and Robert Benton, Best Screenplay, Best Director. Kramer vs. Kramer, a very special experience. Rated PG. Starts Friday at a theater near you. It started with one automobile. A fuel-efficient automobile that offered more than just fuel efficiency. It started with Lynx. Now for 1982, Lincoln Mercury presents a totally new Lynx. The five-door Lynx. Lynx. Now more than ever, the world belongs to Lincoln Mercury. The yogurt of France is called Yo Play. To some Americans, just saying it's the yogurt of France means nothing till they first taste Yo Play. Then they'll believe it's creamy, smooth, all-natural yogurt with real fruit. It's just amazing what happens when a real American gets his first taste of French culture. Your play est délicieux. C'est si creamy, si deux. Et les fruits sont naturels. Your play est incroyable. Your play yogurt. Get a little taste of French culture. Wake up! Together again before half a million people. Simon and Garfunkel last weekend in New York. Will they reunite? Geraldo Rivera with an inside look at the amazing concert of Simon and Garfunkel when 2020 continues. Next week, all the news and celebrity marriages on Good Morning America. Can't you tell me how to get a passport? No. Where can I find federal regulations on importing animals? I don't know. Do you know how I go about getting a patent? Wish I did. Can somebody help us? 
The Federal Information Center can. We help citizens who have any questions concerning the government and don't know which office can provide the answer. Just contact your Federal Information Center. We're listed in the phone book under U.S. Government. Our job is to help you get the answer. After 10 p.m., calls within the state are a whole lot cheaper. At this rate, you can talk all night. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. Back when most filling stations meant gas only, John Quinn, for a company to become Chevron, turns all his filling stations into service stations by ingeniously installing air compressors and water outlets, crossing another frontier. Today, Chevron's commitment to service is even greater, evidenced by its Hallmark Award program, recognizing Chevron dealers also committed to service, from your underhood needs to your windshield. Chevron was born on the frontier, and we've never left it. A junket to Japan, tomorrow at 7. Tonight, right now, on college campuses all over the United States, thousands of young men are caught up in a ritual of joining college fraternities called pledging. The boys are hoping they'll be accepted, liked, wanted. And in their anxiety, some endure a kind of torture called hazing. With a report, here is Bob Brown. Bob? Few pledging varies from fraternity to fraternity and college to college. And by the way, our report tonight deals only with fraternities, not sororities. At some universities, pledging can be fun or safe or even educational. But at others, the hazing rituals are sadistic and dangerous. Over the past 10 years, there's been a marked increase in the reports of injuries and deaths attributed to hazing, and we've turned up at least 30 instances where students died as a result of hazing accidents. Ray and Maisie Ballou have invested their lives in raising two sons in a good home in Johnsonville, South Carolina. But in the winter of 1980, the continuity they had built as a family was destroyed. Ray received a call from the University of South Carolina, where his youngest son, Barry, had enrolled. In a house in this fraternity quadrangle, Ray was told, his son had died after a party in which pledges were encouraged to drink a concoction of alcohol. Ray and Maisie then learned that Barry was overcome by alcohol poisoning in front of his fraternity brothers. They laid him on the sofa on his stomach in case he nauseated. And uh, when one of the boys went down at 7 or 7.15 to wake him up, they couldn't wake Barry. So uh, he immediately ran back upstairs and told his friend that he thought that Barry, that Barry was dead. A coroner's inquest called the incident an unfortunate accident, and the case was closed. But Barry's death was similar to a number of other deaths that have occurred as a result of fraternity initiation practices called hazing, subjecting a prospective member or pledge to a variety of personal abuses, ranging from beatings to forced consumption of alcohol, in rituals where almost everyone participates, but no one takes responsibility. You've got to... You got to have someone to point your finger at. That's it. Someone to be in charge. And according to the inquest of our son's death, no one was in charge. Barry Ballou's death in a fraternity house here at the University of South Carolina was not an isolated incident. In the last two years, at least 15 students have died of accidents related to pledge rituals or fraternity initiations at universities throughout the country. Scores of others have been injured, many of them seriously. The tight secrecy under which many initiations traditionally are planned and carried out has made it difficult for universities to confront the problem. Dr. Donald Ragusa, Dean of Student Life at Bowling Green State University of Ohio. You can educate them as much as you possibly can. You can take every possible means to ensure that they, they don't haze. But if they're going to haze, they will. If they're going to drag let's say, five pledges out to the track and have them run five miles at three o'clock in the morning at nine degrees above zero, they're going to do it, and no system will prevent that. Up, down, up. What you are witnessing is a situation just as Dr. Ragusa described, a hazing being carried out at a major East Coast university by a chapter of a national fraternity. It was filmed by 2020 cameraman Chuck Clifton with a lens attachment called a night scope that amplifies even the dimmest light. 2020 agreed to identify neither the university nor the fraternity in exchange for the fraternity's permission to have a camera present during hazing activities. 
It is 19 degrees in the middle of the night. And although this may look like a harmless type of pledge harassment, two of the hazing deaths recorded in 1980 occurred as a result of pledges overexerting themselves during calisthenics. But calisthenics are only part of what can be bizarre hazing rituals. I know of blindfolded pledges being asked to uh, give one of their testicles for the fraternity while a, uh, while a running chainsaw is uh, held against, touched against their leg. Near this the former there. Midwestern chapter president of the National Fraternity asked that his name not be used on this program, but he is supporting a national drive against hazing. Why do fraternities continue to practice it? To question those pledging activities, to question those hazing activities, is to question the reason for the organization itself, because everything has a purpose. And, and when you question that, the, the fear of being ostracized, the peer pressure involved is enormous. The attraction to fraternity life has increased enormously in the last few years, after hitting rock bottom during the Vietnam War era, an average of around 34 members per chapter. Today, the average is 49 members per chapter, and there are almost 5,000 chapters at universities in the United States and Canada. The increase in membership has also coincided with an increase in hazing and other related activities, especially drinking. This is called a canoe race. The participants drink beer and relay rounds as fast as they can. It is a typical contest in the lives of many fraternities, and it becomes more than just a pastime when it's combined with hazing. 98% of the hazing is linked to alcohol, and there's the control factor. It gets out of control. Uh, you may be paddling someone, and all of a sudden, you miss and hit them in the back instead of uh, on the buttocks, and you now have a ruptured spleen or a ruptured kidney. <laughs> And this is the type of activity that usually occurs before a hazing. A gathering of brothers, a lot of drinking. The ritual you're about to see involves psychological hazing, an attempt to break down new pledges. The location now is outside a tavern, where the pledges were told to arrive at 7.30 p.m. Then, they were forced to wait for several hours in parked cars. They've been told they'll be taken to an interview with fraternity members to help determine whether they're good enough to be accepted into the house. Well, you're up. All right, listen. What you gotta do is you gotta go down there and you gotta sell yourself, okay? It's, just, it's not like any other interview you've ever been through before. You got any questions? No. All right, so you ready? Let's go. Good luck, man. That's it. Just remember, every, everybody's gone through the exact same thing. Again, the fraternity in acting this hazing was promised anonymity. Heads up. All right. Heads up down here, right? The pledge has been led to believe it is a serious interview, but he'll soon discover there are no correct answers to any of the questions. He's taken down to the basement of the tavern, where the brothers we've seen drinking upstairs, around 25 of them, have gathered. A bright light is shown in the pledge's face, and an interrogation begins, an interrogation designed to make the pledge nervous and uncomfortable, to shake his composure. Chris, you gotta understand what's gonna happen now. You gotta pretend you're a salesman. You're gonna sell your soul to us. What do you think you could do for this fraternity? We're gonna get rid of the garbage now. I wanna get down to nitty gritty. What do you think you could do for... Oh, wait, I think Let you me want to ask Chris. Give him a chance to answer. Look right into that last mistake. Get that. Read him. I'll do whatever you ask me. What the brothers will ask him to do, producing a large knife and a drinking glass, is to give to a bogus blood drive by cutting himself. Again, the pledge has no way of determining whether they're serious, and they lead him to believe they are. Now, to give blood, don't cut this side of your wrist. Cut this side of the wrist. Go ahead. We don't Drop want it right in that glass. Go ahead. Look at the light! Whoa, whoa, let me ask you something. Did you just say you give blood? Get the light! Yes. Look well, at well, the what light. is this? This ain't no blood drive. What, what, do you, what do you mean this ain't no blood drive? This is our blood drive. 
We come down here and give blood neglect. God, do you trust us? Do you trust us? And if you get in this fraternity, I'll never consider you a brother. Because you, you ain't your life! All day, time for number one. You know what that this, is, Jack? You know what this is? Okay, this is a black belt. No matter what the pledge says, although he doesn't know it, it is a foregone conclusion that he'll be handed three black balls that indicate he's been rejected by the membership. He won't be told for another two or three days whether he has, in fact, passed the test. It has to be eradicated. Uh, it has to be stopped. Jack Anson is executive director of the National Interfraternity Conference, an organization to which most major fraternities belong and which opposes the type of hazing you've just seen. I, I would find this uh, completely intolerable, completely out of place. It isn't necessary that there be hazing or the, the, the trial by test in order to, uh, quote, prove yourself uh, uh, worthy of becoming a member. That, that really is not a part of it and should not be. Fraternities that don't haze are considered boys clubs. The most domineering personalities in the fraternity, oftentimes the loud guys, the macho, uh, the macho figures in the house reinforce that, that image, the boys club. The harder the pledgeship is, the better. You have to earn it. You have to earn your manhood. You have to earn your brotherhood. What do we want? What do we want? What do we want? Do and so it becomes, as it has been described so many times, a rite of passage, often brutal, that is missing one key element of the traditional rites of passage associated with tribes that require tests of manhood. This test doesn't have an adult to oversee it, and the pledges who run this gauntlet are merely trying to see whether their names are on a list of new brothers attached to a tree at the top of a hill. It is below freezing and the ground is hard. The members have been drinking. They attack the pledges as they run up the hill with no indication of how long the resistance might last. One pledge, exhausted after being knocked around, had to be helped up the hill to the tree. Despite real concern for pledges who might have been injured in the gauntlet, others still try, all without knowing that their names are already on the tree. Two years ago, a Harvard University pledge was paralyzed for life in a wrestling match with members. One of the worst shocks of all for a parent whose child dies in a hazing incident is that the parent is often alone and deliberately cut off by college administrators and fraternities from anyone who knows how it really happened. Get up, Get up And when I walked into that sterile room and saw my six foot two strapping son on a stainless steel table covered with a sheet, his blue eyes closed to me forever, realizing he would not be coming home, it was truly the darkest moment of my life. Eileen Stevens of Sayville, New York, appears on campuses throughout the United States to speak against hazing. She found her son Chuck dead in a morgue near the campus of Alfred University after he'd been locked in the trunk of a car in sub-freezing weather with two other pledges and told to consume an amount of alcohol that killed him. When she went to see her son's body, no one from the university met her. In fact, she was told to go home and wait for information. Three years later, she has received no legal document other than an autopsy report. It was a total disregard for human life. A boy was dead, two others almost died, and uh, nothing was done. It was considered an unfortunate accident, an isolated incident, uh, and no one was held responsible. And that was a bitter, bitter shock and disappointment. At Bowling Green State University, administrators choose not to look the other way. They encourage fraternities and sororities to rechannel their activities away from hazing. Tonight, there is something called a Florida fling beer blast on campus, but it is a different kind of ritual. This combined fraternity sorority event was founded to raise money for the Heart Fund. 
It is the type of activity that most fraternities and sororities like to be identified with. And national members of the Interfraternity Conference are quick to emphasize these social and charitable works. Even anti-hazing activists stress that they are not anti-fraternity. They say they simply want to make someone take a responsibility that in the past has been shunned by universities and shrugged off by local prosecutors. I think there should be penalties that, that suit the crime. And I feel that the word crime is not too strong a word because when a young man's life is taken or someone is seriously injured, trust is abused, uh, young men are taken advantage of, and um, I think that those responsible should pay the penalty. There is a changing perspective reflected in the attitudes and debates. Away from considering hazing as a first right of manhood and viewing it instead more as a last right of adolescence. Fraternity officers would like to eliminate the issue if only because it has overshadowed commitments they are proud of. Ray and Maisie Ballou say they are not against fraternities, but they hope to come to grips with the loss of a son by reminding us how pointlessly Barry Ballou and at least 30 others in the last decade have died. If I can be of any help to any young person or parent in this whole United States, uh, let them know what they're going, let them know what to expect. Let the parents know what to expect. Uh, and the university schools, let them know what might happen, what might happen. Bob, is the government, or is anybody really, doing anything about this situation? Well, Hugh, eight states have passed laws to prosecute those responsible for injuries or deaths during hazing. And in South Carolina, where uh, Barry Ballou died, the legislature is now considering an anti-hazing law. Thank you, Bob. Last Saturday, Simon and Garfunkel sang before half a million people their first concert together in 11 years. Geraldo Rivera has an inside look at that concert next. is a different kind of American wagon. The 1982 Lynx from Lincoln Mercury. Lynx not only has the best fuel efficiency rating of any wagon made in America, it's the only one with both front wheel drive for traction and four wheel fully independent suspension for riding comfort. Lynx, now more than ever, the world belongs to Lincoln Mercury. I'm your mother. How can you know more? Mom, it's true. For feminine itching and irritation, you can't buy anything more effective than Massengill medicated disposable douche. It's the only leading disposable with septicin, an effective medicine for temporary relief of minor feminine itching and irritation. Sanitary and convenient, too, because it's disposable. And I know Massengill's a name you can trust. For temporary relief of minor feminine itching and irritation, Massengill medicated disposable douche. It works. Yeah! Feeling so good inside, it's something you can't hide. Feeling so good it shows, everybody knows it's a silly Posturepedic morning. Feeling so good it shows, because Posturepedic is designed in cooperation with leading orthopedic surgeons for no morning backache from sleeping on a too soft mattress. It's a silly Posturepedic morning, yeah! Saturday at the Coliseum, a forum which will probably decide the nation's top team. The undefeated USC Trojans, led by tailback Marcus Allen, do battle with undefeated Oklahoma or other regional combat. The excitement begins earlier that day as Boston College, which upset Texas A&M in their opener, battles undefeated North Carolina and other regional contests of might and right. Classic NCAA college football action, Saturday on ABC. It will surely rank with Woodstock in the history of popular music happenings. The concert last Saturday of one of the great singing teams of the 60s, Simon and Garfunkel, in Central Park in New York City. It was a benefit for Central Park, and it was their first time together after a separation of 11 years. Naturally, all kinds of questions were raised about the future. Half a million people came to that concert. And here with a special look at this special musical event is Geraldo Rivera. Geraldo. Thanks, yeah. 
It's not like they haven't been around. For the last decade, Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel have, of course, remained in the public eye with their movies and their music. They just haven't been together. But it was together that we first met and fell in love with their very special sound, so I had a dream. I mean, about a half a million other people last Saturday night in Central Park. We dream we saw Simon and Garfunkel together again in concert. I'm sitting in the railway station, got a ticket for my destination. From the moment it was announced, the intense interest of the press made it clear this wasn't going to be just a concert. An event was in the making. America's super act of the 60s, Simon and Garfunkel were coming back to perform together. When I interviewed Paul on the day before the concert, hundreds of thousands of people were already expected. What is the motivating emotion, then, you think, for all those hundreds of thousands of people? I mean, how, how would you explain their... their reason for being there well you got the free aspect <laughs> I, think, I think that starts off. i think that's a, that's a that's an inducement right there he's kidding of course the desire to see them together again in concert was motivated by a lot more than simple economics their music described and defined a turbulent but also idealistic and romantic time in our history Let us be lovers we'll marry our fortunes together we were very much a part of a lot of people's lives when they were grow growing up and uh, you know the music of uh, the music that we like in our adolescence and you know twenties around and that that tends to be the music that you like through life that's the music that you get sentimental over when you say to whoever you say it to remember that hello darkness my old friend because a vision softly Left its seat while I was sleeping, and the vision that was planted in my brain still remains within the sound of silence. I remember the 60s as being very rich and, you know, idealistic. Is that part of the reason for the scope of what's happening in the park? I don't know what the scope of what's happening in the park. I haven't, you know, we'll see tomorrow. Uh, we don't know what this event is. We'll see. We'll see. Everyone expected it would be big, but no one figured just how big. Despite the gray and overcast day, 500,000 people filled the great lawn of New York Central Park to overflowing. It was the largest concert audience for a single act in the history of the country. And everyone within earshot was delighted by the music of Simon.